All right. Well, thank you, Sally, for that uh, great introduction. And uh, I really appreciated the opportunity to be here today and talk with many of you over the past couple days. Um, I wanted to explain a, a bit more about why I work for Cummins and why I found it interesting over the past two decades. Um, so my dad is a physicist and, and taught me a passion for complex problems and a belief that anything is possible, a belief that makes me feel very comfortable here because I think many of the people in the audience share that. Um, I pursued a degree in engineering because of this and because I thought math and science was interesting and relatively easy to learn. Um, but after um, finishing my bachelor's, I had a chance to spend a year in Sierra Leone in a program similar to the Peace Corps. Um, and there, I realized I didn't understand many of the problems facing the community, but there were others there who did. And I also learned from my mom just an interest in understanding people and many of the problems facing the community. Um, so she liked to draw out the best in people. So from that, I think um, one of the things I've had a chance to do at Cummins and enjoy is combining these experiences to put together people who understand problems with experts who understand pieces of possible solutions and make progress on meaningful challenges. So um, I went on to further education at Ohio State Center for Automotive Research um, and have really enjoyed the past two decades at Cummins, uh, first developing controls and diagnostics to lower engine emissions, as Sally said, while improving fuel efficiency, and more recently, um, just really more broadly seeking to understand key problems and putting together uh, diverse, talented teams to solve them. So um, today I'll talk about a few things. Um, first, I'll share just a little bit of background on Cummins. I know some in the audience are familiar with it, but not all of you. Um, our technical focus on a superpower solution for a wide variety of markets. I'll tell you a little bit about the role we see for diesel in the future and why uh, we see gasoline and natural gas also as part of the solution. I'll describe how we've been able to help the UK as they move toward an ambitious goal of decommissioning all their coal burning power plants by 2025 and quickly touch on a collaboration with Microsoft on a possible future for data centers. And finally, uh, I'll talk a little bit about improving vehicle efficiency with connectivity and big data options before wrapping up with some thoughts on some future challenges. So on Cummins, um, this um, is a picture of, of one of our early uh, chairman and CEOs, um, J. Irwin Miller. And you know, he made this, this statement more than 40 years ago. Um, and while this belief in responsible corporate citizenship is quite common or, or more common these days and I know is part of um, what the um, Stanford uh, vision is, it was, I think, less, less common in those days. And much, I think, of Cummins' growth around the world and our success um, has been rooted in this value and this vision um, ever since. So uh, the statement reflected then as it does now um, our corporate commitment to sustainability, um, which includes environmental sustainability. And he knew that business doesn't succeed in a silo. In fact, our success is really bound to the ability of our communities, societies, and the environment to thrive. So, um, I'm going to give a few examples of things Cummins um, and I have done over the last decades to reduce the CO2 impact of our products. And, but I do realize global warming is a huge complex problem that'll take many people around the world contributing. What I'm going to talk about is just a small piece of that. Um, but I share it because it's part of my work. I'm proud of it. And especially for students in the audience, I, I want you to feel you can make a difference. If you choose something that you care about, work hard over a period of time, um, you can make, a make an Im impact. So um, this uh, first, just a bit on the issue as we see it. Um, 200,000 uh, small humans join us on Earth every day. And you know, not only is this a challenge for our carbon footprint over time, but it puts a strain on our natural resources. According to the World Health Organization, urban outdoor air pollution is estimated to cause 3.1 million premature deaths worldwide. Uh, per year, and Health Effects Institute has recently expanded research to India and China, where ambient particulate matter pollution is the fourth largest disease burden causing premature death in large cities like Beijing, uh, where vehicle emissions are the largest source of dangerous particulate matter. So this picture um, on the top of the screen here was actually taken by a Cummins employee out of the window of our Beijing office. 
And while uh, the view was a bit clearer when I was looking out this window in July as it had recently rained, um, I realized this is a reality of life for the Cummins employees that work in this office and the roughly 25 million people who live in Beijing um, every day. So we can't separate the environment from the community or from society as a whole. So um, looking across our business sort of first in what we're doing internally and then I'll, I'll look outward. Um, we've identified three environmental priorities. Um, first, reducing our impact on climate change, using fewer natural resources, and partnering with a really wide variety of stakeholders. So um, the US Department of Energy's Better Plants program, for instance, to solve complex problems. Um, so we're working on reducing facility greenhouse gases by conserving energy, um, improving the renewables that we use and the power source uh, for, for our facilities. We have 11 facilities with solar arrays installed and plans for more. Um, a power purchase agreement with Meadow Lake um, in Indiana, which is where our corporate headquarters is located, um, which will expand by 75 megawatts, um, which can power roughly 20,000 Indiana homes, um, adding to an existing 600 megawatt capacity there. Um, but while we're looking internally at what we can do with our own facilities, 99% um, of our carbon footprint comes from our products in use. So um, we've set a goal of partnering with our customers to reach an annual reduction of 3.5 million metric tons of carbon dioxide by 2020, um, and saving 350 million gallons of fuel annually. So if I correctly understood Sally's challenge yesterday um, of 36 billion tons of CO2 per year, um, this would mean we would contribute 0.01% of one year's target reduction. So you know, I, I would hope and we will continue to search for more. Um, but again, it's important for everyone to do a part. We have 15 million legacy engines in use around the world. So we're continually focused on improving our products making them cleaner, um, and have programs in place to help customers use their existing engines more efficiently. And for the first time this year, also we'll sell more engines outside the US than inside, and helping provide cleaner products to areas with lagging emission regulations is one of our most effective ways, again, to improve greenhouse gas emissions. So where are those 15 million engines used? Um, just to give you a sense of what we do and where our products are, uh, we power buses that are run by Beijing Public Transit, uh, both diesel and natural gas versions. Um, we provide backup power for Wrigley Field in Chicago um, and the Statue of Liberty. Uh, we provide engines for trucks, trains, boats, construction, agriculture equipment all over the globe. Um, we supply mine trucks that operate, uh, for example, at 14,000 feet um, in an Altamina mine in Peru and high altitude mines in Chile. Uh, the photo at the bottom right is one that I took at the bottom of Bingham Canyon uh, copper mine in Utah, which is considered the largest man-made excavation in the world, uh, producing over 19 million tons of copper um, in its over 100-year history. So we make engines that do really hard work. Um, they need to be reliable. Not only do many of our customers depend on these products for their livelihood, but they're critical to health and safety as well. We power rescue equipment, backup generators for hospitals, and the list goes on. Um, innovations in, in these markets are complex and often well outside the more personally familiar passenger car examples that are often discussed related to transportation. And recent hurricanes have also brought up in my mind uh, the importance of energy diversity in times of crisis. So in cases when a grid goes down, for example, pure electric emergency vehicles may not be able to recharge. So as I mentioned uh, a couple slides ago, the best opportunity for us, uh, Cummins, to help with a decarbonized future is to continue to provide the best technology for our customers across a wide variety of options. We spend more than 700 million annually in R&D and frequently partner across the globe um, with our own technical teams, um, technical centers in the US, UK, India, China, Sao Paulo and Brazil, and elsewhere around the world. Um, with universities, national labs, other industry partners. And I'm excited about a few examples um, that seem to have the potential to shape the future of the industries we participate in. So I pulled in some of those examples to share with you today. I hope you find them thought-provoking and, and interesting. 
So first, a little bit about where we've Steps, steps is uh, particularly meaningful to me because it exactly uh, the journey exactly aligns with the two decades that I've been at Cummins. Um, we've been on a journey during that time to dramatically reduce NOx and particulate emissions from diesel engines while improving efficiency. We've achieved near zero levels. So there have been many challenges along the way and consistent steps in the regulations have really been instrumental in driving this change and allowing our continued investment over this period of time. So our focus on the system that provides the power allows us also to build just a deep technical understanding of that system and how to innovate and optimize the key elements of the system. So we have built expertise over the years in the diesel engine as it has evolved from a relatively simple mechanical engine to an electronic system with advanced air handling, fuel systems after treatment um, to reduce the exhaust emissions and advanced controls. And we've expanded beyond diesel um, to include natural gas. Uh, through that journey, uh, we've hired and developed a broad range of technical experts, many with advanced degrees, and have nearly 7,000 engineers worldwide um, in areas of combustion, chemistry, power electronics, advanced controls, application engineering, among others. Um, we've added a number of new components to diesel engines during the stair-stepping you saw in the previous slide, um, which reduce emissions while improving fuel efficiency. So some of them are in the photos here. And developing them has been quite interesting and complex. Um, high pressure common rail fuel systems, for example, have required innovation in manufacturing to re meet the stringent tolerances needed for the necessary system capability. Turbo machinery has required aerodynamics analysis. And the combustion analysis has required partnerships with universities and combustion code providers to continually push the envelope of what's possible to model so we can explore huge numbers of options for optimized design. So nearly 100 years ago, we brought the diesel engine to the US truck market, replacing gasoline. Um, and as we approach our 100 year anniversary, um, we're working to reinvent what our products and offerings will look like and how they need to evolve over the next 100 years. So that's the um, process that Sally mentioned that she was a part of. Um, and, um, it's, it's been a really useful exercise to go and reflect. So some of the things I'll talk about today are, are an outcome of that process. Um, we also seek to develop what we call fit-for-market products and data-enabled solutions that meet the market-specific economic and application requirements. So as I've described so far, we have a, just a really wide variety of markets and, and needs uh, that our customers have. So I mentioned the super power solution. Um, we plan to be ready to provide a range of power technologies then to our customers from diesel and natural gas, internal combustion engines to hybrid and some fully electric powertrains. Um, we're also working on advanced diesel, other alternative fuels, and some fuel cell technologies. Um, and have announced and continue to seek partnerships. Um, I liked what Andy Karstner said earlier, uh, providing differentiated solutions to high value problems. So we recently announced a partnership with the Cadiz um, and the U.S. Department of Defense to develop an opposed piston engine, in which promises a 13% reduction in fuel consumption and a 50% increase in power density. Um, we also just announced um, yesterday, I believe, to, uh, uh, intention to acquire Bromo, which is an energy storage company. So we'll provide customers with the best solutions for their applications, and when markets are ready, um, you know, we're going to seek to be ready to provide that. But again, energy diversity is, is really key to the future, and a one-size-fits-all solution um, through this transition will not likely be vol vi viable across all the markets. Um, we do have a distribution business um, that works really closely with customers um, in over 178 countries. And so that's a, a good way to stay close to the markets and understand when markets might be ready for a change. So um, some various forms of powertrains are, are in this photo here. And actually, the majority of engines in the large commercial applications that I work on in my current role, um, like sea freight, mining, and rail, are actually already electric drive. So more heavy-duty transportation is, is likely to transition to electric, uh, some form of electric drive in the coming years. Some storage, energy storage, or waste heat recovery could be added um, as the technologies become viable for particular customer use cases. Because of the energy density of, of internal combustion engines, um, running on liquid fuels will likely continue um, in some of these markets for many years to come. There are still significant efficiency gains possible, plus shifting towards lower carbon fuels, uh, 
um, can also be explored. So we'll continue to electrify components in the engine to make it more efficient. That translates across many of our markets and applications. And right now, um, though it's not something that will likely be purchased in large numbers right away, uh, for some urban and regional truck applications, electrification with storage will soon uh, become economically viable. So uh, we announced recently um, an intention to put an electric um, truck, a Class 7 driveline, into the market um, in 2019 and have a range extender planned for 2020. So transit, bus, pickup and delivery markets. Um, so the, if you want to see a picture of the electric demonstrator, it's called EOS, and um, there are photos of that online. So in, also in March of 2018, we're going to add uh, to heavy-duty engine offerings a, a next generation of a 12-liter engine, um, which in this case, um, we've just dramatically reduced the weight of that engine. Uh, 600 pounds lighter than other engines in, in that category. So again, that adds to the freight that, that can be carried in those pickup and delivery applications. And you know, as we think about the next generation of engines, um, we'll focus on innovations that can make the engine more efficient, uh, more powerful, smaller, lighter, reduced maintenance, and uh, make sure that new technologies can interface quite well. Um, this uh, picture here uh, coming in 2022 um, is an engine that is leveraging some of the technologies developed through the U.S. Department of Energy Super Truck Program. And you see here that we've been able to demonstrate 50% brake thermal efficiency on that product um, with the engine alone and then 55% by adding waste heat recovery where we have a turbine expander that then works through a gearbox and puts the um, energy from the heat back into the, the drivetrain. So 55% is quite progress uh, from, from where we've been in the past, and 75% freight efficiency improvement was demonstrated by adding some vehicle and trailer aerodynamics elements as well. And of course, advanced controls um, were a big part of this. It's one of the areas that is one of my favorites, um, and I've heard a lot of interest in that at Stanford during the conversations here. So one other interesting uh, example I thought was interesting um, was called Ethos. This was jointly funded between Cummins and the California Energy Commission to create a demonstration in 2014. This vehicle uses E85. Um, I've heard some conflicting opinions on E85 over the past two days. Um, but we were able to do something quite useful with it um, in this study, lowering the carbon intensity of this standard pickup and delivery truck um, by 70 to 80 percent. Uh, depending on the baseline you use, either a diesel 6.7 liter engine or a gasoline 6 liter engine. Um, this uses a 2.8 liter engine, um, but it delivers the power and the torque that's needed for the cycle. So um, one of the, we were able to downspeed the engine from 4,000 RPM uh, to 2,000 RPM rated power and boost the torque with the E85. And you may wonder why Cummins, which we primarily do diesel and natural gas engines, is working on gasoline, um, taking advantage of the low knock fuel um, the E85 provides allowed us to significantly increase BMEP uh, from traditional gasoline engines. And this leveraged our understanding of structure um, that a diesel engine needs for that significant power density. So this product hit 42% brake thermal efficiency, which is quite good for vehicles in this class. And many of the low carbon fuels certified under the California program um, are really targeted at SI engines. So this type of approach could be an important piece of the heavy duty transportation future puzzle. Um, one example uh, from the team that I currently lead in the UK is in this photo. So in this site, um, it's in Carrington near Manchester. Um, I visited during commissioning last September. Now provides 20 megawatts of uh, power enough to power 20,000 standard UK homes. It uses 10 Cummins containerized lean burn natural gas reciprocating engines. And as the UK committed to decommissioning coal burning power plants by 2025 and installing offshore wind, they're using distributed natural gas power for when the wind isn't blowing. Um, so UK Power Reserve um, contracted Cummins to install 400 megawatts of distributed natural gas capacity reserve around the UK. And I'm going to be curious to see how many other countries um, or regions follow this approach. 
Um, this distributed banks of 20 megawatt can allow limited installation of additional grid infrastructure um, by distributing the power close to suburbs or, or industry users. So I think I heard from yesterday's discussion as well that an approach of this sort with localized microgrids might be what it takes to quickly bring Puerto Rico back from their recent disaster. Um, just a few things on a new product that's coming out um, in another year. Um, this is also two megawatts, um, but again, in the interest of continual progression, it's a little bit shorter, so it more easily fits in a, a standard 40-foot ISO high cube container. And as uh, natural gas quality, um, energy density varies quite widely. Um, depending on the source, um, it expands the fuel flexibility. Um, this one I'm happy to be talking about while standing here. It's an example of two large companies working together, uh, Microsoft and Cummins, to innovate and see if we can disrupt ourselves. Um, fuel cells could have the power to be a disruptor in power generation, um, and we want to look at this example to see if there's a more cost-effective data center solution. Um, so we're working together with Microsoft, and I'll show um, sort of before and after a picture here. Um, so the grid model here shown is described as incumbent, has the servers inside the building, um, and then has the um, standby power generation in a separate area with all the automatic transfer switch gear and then a connection to the utility um, that's used. And the, those generators in that case are used as backup and an insurance policy for when the grid goes down. So the alternative here with solid oxide fuel cells would integrate the servers with the solid oxide fuel cells. And while the cost of the fuel cells is still um, quite high as compared to the backup generation, the savings in this approach is more in not having to connect to the grid. So all of that switch gear and the copper um, that is needed to connect to the utility. So it also could have some security advantages as there's no grid connection if there's a natural gas supply. So um, just touching on, on connected um, customer care and, and using big data, by the end of the decade, every engine we ship around the world um, will be an electronic engine, at least in the on-highway and off-highway space. So we'll be able to use the data and give data to our customers to do their job more efficiently. We're starting to deploy a wide variety of apps uh, to help our customers make better use of their product. So one example is a connected software app. Um, it helps with calibration uploads, um, like you get an upload on your iPhone and it's now in production. It can also be used by service technicians uh, to connect to engines. We also have an app called Connected Advisor for fleets and, operator and owner operators. And we can do a few things with that, warn customers of problems um, up to a week ahead of time could empower fleet managers to make better in mission decisions and um, should a vehicle complete a route, should it be stopped immediately, could mean less reliance on the driver communication back uh, to the fleet manager of issues. It also could mean clearer actionable recommendations about when a vehicle could be serviced and to integrate that into the plan uh, for use of that vehicle. So for example, in a school bus fleet that could use this product could mean fewer students stuck in school buses on the side of the road which we'd obviously like to avoid. So information that helps our customers improve their uptime and total cost of ownership is our focus for the use of the data. Um, I show a picture of a mine truck here. So in mines, we're using um, this data to support three different goals. First, just enabling faster repair. Uh, downtime for a truck of this type can cost up to $10,000 an hour in lost uh, revenue for a mine. And so that's important um, that repairs be fast, um, but better to avoid them entirely and integrate fixes into standard repair cycles. Um, so allowing improved operational efficiency, um, looking at overall site optimization, and then finally improving product quality by uh, using that data to in engineer better solutions. So um, I'll close by just saying a lot has changed um, and is changing. It's really a pivotal time for Cummins um, and for these industries, heavy duty transportation and distributed generation. To succeed in the long term, we plan to continue innovating for our customers as we've done uh, through our 100 year history to this point. Um, we're quickly adapting our company um, as well as using new approaches. Um, we have a digital accelerator branch and a growth office that's working with startups and um, some of our recent partnerships uh, came through that branch. 
Um, we're looking at new opportunities to grow um, through our own development and then some of the, the acquisition uh, that was announced yesterday in his example as well. Um, some, some thoughts to leave you with. Um, clarity of policies, regulations, and market incentives are important to allow investment in some of these technologies uh, for publicly traded companies such as ourselves. Um, incentives, policies, and research should stay broad across a range of technologies and approaches. I was really happy to see uh, the GSET broad portfolio uh, that I got to see yesterday, although this is my first time uh, coming to this session. And internal combustion engines will be part of a transition towards a low carbon future for some time. Distributed power generation using either fuel cells or natural gas can offer some unexpected system level advantages. So it's not just directly comparing the cost of the power itself. And significant efficiencies remain um, and can be found uh, through new technologies applied to challenging um, markets um, in industries such as oil and gas, mining, and shipping freight over land and sea. So that's what I had to talk about today, and I'd welcome any questions or discussion. Hi, an excellent presentation. Of all those innovations, are they only into new engines or do you have programs to retrofit into legacy engines that are out on the road? We do have some programs to improve uh, fuel efficiency of engines on the road. One of the ones I've been involved in is for mine site engines and we do some optimization and can offer fuel efficiency improvements to existing engines. Um, so that often, you know, customers are interested because it saves money in, in operation. Um, some level of efficiency, though, um, costs costs money. So, so we have a mix. Yeah, good Thank question. You. Are you guys looking at uh, onboard capture for CO2? You know, I was listening intently to Sally's talk earlier. Um, we, we've been, I'd say, paying attention to it. Um, I would love to see if that were possible. Um, I, I haven't seen, so I would love to read any material that would say that would be feasible. What percentage of long haul trucks are natural gas now, and what do you see that going in the future, and is the infrastructure in place for them to carry the what is it, three times larger tanks or hmm. than gasoline, or I don't know what the ratio is for diesel, but <laughs> they can go a long way before they have to refuel, but they need places to be Yes. Refuel. Yeah, it's a good question, and you know, we have, I think, the only product on the market for heavy-duty trucks in the U.S. in natural gas, and the limitation right now is the infrastructure to refuel. So the trucks you'll see behind the cab have a slightly larger box than a, a standard cab, um, but they do go reasonable distance, but we need places to refuel. And another challenge, uh, we've talked with some uh, companies about installing corridors, um, but much of the value in a heavy duty truck is actually in the resale. And so if there are just limited corridors, then um, that is less valuable than if it's more um, widespread. So it's a challenge on um, rolling out natural gas engines, although they do offer a lower carbon alternative. Hey, um, separate from the data analysis with the customer feedback on the, the, the stuff in the field, are you looking at new computational methods for designing engines? Yes. Yeah, that has been a, a very useful area. So in combustion, I think, was one of the earlier areas. Um, but we have a, a multi-dimensional optim design optimization approach we've been using recently to look at lots of different options for architecture choice, um, you know, what type of air handling, what kind of fuel system parameters. And, um, and it does uh, let us look at more options. You know, a human brain can think of maybe 30 things at once. Um, and, and the you know, Pew concept kind of generation only goes so far. So some of those approaches, I think, will have a bigger and bigger role to play in choosing the right set of components to combine. Uh, 
I was wondering if you have any uh, special products or business connections related to powertrains for compressors, either in gas pipelines or in, uh, or in the manufacturing applications with compressed gases. Yes, so um, one of the um, markets for this engine here um, could be gas compression. So, um, and, and there are some that um, start at about a half a megawatt and, and go up to the two megawatt range. Uh-oh. I love the example that you had of trying to flip around the data center and doing it the other way and putting SOFCs um, on site. Mm -hmm. When I think of natural gas, it, it's got a grid, and is it more or less reliable than the electrical one? You, I'm sure, know a lot more about that than I do. But natural gas is hard to store. Mm -hmm. Or are you thinking of maybe putting a preprocessor in there and storing mm -hmm. propane or mm -hmm. methanol or something else? Is mm -hmm. there a bigger vision in there? No, good question. Um, but no, I have not been involved or that I'm aware of in, in that. Um, but that could be a good question. This looks at just natural gas, if it's available, to a more efficient use of how to generate electricity. Are you finding that there is a natural limit beyond which a truck, a large truck, could not benefit from a battery-operated engine? Is there, is there, a, is, is there a, point, a tipping point beyond which it's not possible? Or is it just a matter of engineering and, and, and it is possible? Hmm. So um, we've seen so far that the smaller trucks um, that go shorter distances, at least with the state of today's batteries, make more sense. So, you know, I saw some pretty interesting research the last couple days on, on batteries, um, but the, the durability expectations of heavy-duty over-the-road truck engines are a million miles, and so if it is possible, as a researcher earlier said that batteries could have infinite life, you know, then that would help. Um, and then the distance that you'd have to go with in the weight of the current batteries uh, to make a feasible um, distance um, movement for freight um, haven't made sense for over-the-road trucks, the Class 8 trucks. So, you know, as batteries evolve, those things could change. Um, but with the state of technology today, there's a tipping point. You know, we're going to try a Class 7 um, electric drive. But again, I think the market penetration for that will be small initially, and we'll see where it goes with um, battery technology. Thank you. So I remember back um, a couple years ago, maybe five years ago or so, and, and there was this idea of, you know, the natural gas highway, and, <laughs> and, and at the time, the price of oil was very ho uh, high, the price of gas was low, and it seemed like there was a lot of momentum towards, you know, more uh, natural gas uh, engines, mm -hmm. uh, and then the price of oil dropped. Ha has that had a big impact on, on, on people making the decision to purchase this? So it was really largely driven by economics or, or, or not? Mm -hmm. Yes, it has been. Um, it has driven a shift in what we're developing and um, what customers are asking for. So there are less natural gas engines purchased now. Um, and, but, you know, if, if the price shifts again, um, that, that could change. And natural gas isn't uniformly available, so, you know, it's not fungible like diesel. And so there are pockets where um, natural gas engines are more popular than others. Um, you know, developing, we have natural gas engines and could develop them in more ranges um, if uh, infrastructure could become available. Um, but the infrastructure is, seems like the more complex and pacing item, at least from standing in an engine manufacturer's shoes.